Stanford University. It's really a pleasure to be here, but I have uh, uh, two apologies to make before I start. One is I hurt my leg yesterday, played too much tennis and did too much bike riding, and uh, so I can't stand up <laughs> very easily. So that's why I'm sitting here. And number two, um, I think someone was out to get me. Maybe it was Bill Gates. Just as I opened up the program, my slides an hour ago, the whole thing was corrupted. Fortunately, there's some expertise here at uh, Stanford. <laughs> they resurrected it, but it doesn't look nearly as nice as the original. <laughs> but the content is here. <laughs> so um, I am going to talk about the low carbon fuels, and I'll give you some background and history of it as well as put it in some kind of context. So this is, this is not my style of aesthetics. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but I do take responsibility for the words. Um, so I've been, so this is kind of my, uh, my, the history of my involvement with the Low Carbon Fuel Standard. And I've worked for many years on alternative fuels, written books, and studied life cycle analysis. And had always been interested in some kind of policy framework that would make sense, that would be able to bring alternative fuels into the marketplace in a, in a sensible way. And so a few years ago, late 2006, the governor, our previous governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger, got all excited about a concept that looked like what is now the low carbon fuel standard. And actually, to give credit, it was actually a couple of people from the Nat Natural Resources Defense Council who had approached him about it. And it resonated with him, and he saw it. It fit his paradigm of policies that were good for the economy and good for the environment. So he, he ran, ran with it. So he called in, they called in a few of us academics to kind of vet the idea. They said, you know, does this make sense? Is this a reasonable option? And so two of us that were probably most enthusiastic about it, uh, Alex Farrell and I, Alex Farrell from Berkeley, UC Berkeley, we were asked to follow up and put together a research team to figure out what is a low carbon fuel standard and to come up with at least an initial, poly, uh, initial design of it and assessment of it. So we did that. We put together a research team of, from people from Berkeley, UC Berkeley and UC Davis. And kind of the, 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 the line I give, the joke, it's only a half joke. I say, when I started it, when they asked me to do it, I said, you know, this is going to be a piece of cake. You know, I've spent my whole career work on alternative fuels, life cycle analysis, you know, if there's anything I can do, this is it. I know 95% of what I need to know. <laughs> Sounds like a typical academic, right? <laughs> so as it turned out, I probably knew 20% of what I needed to know. And that's the difference between academic studies and actually implementing real policies in the real world. And here I just listed all of the kinds of issues that we came across. Uh, equity, you know, not necessarily socioeconomic equity, equity between companies, equity between different parts of the state. Uh, and now, of course, as we go national across the country, regulatory, how, do you, how does this uh, match up with other regulations, PUs, public utility commission regulations, cap and trade, and Anyway, the issues go on and on. I had to learn legal. I had to learn about WTO, you know, World Trade Organization issues. I never thought that would be part of what I'd have to worry about. But that's because some of the fuels are made in Brazil or Malaysia and other places. So anyway, we did it. And I'm, you know, we were very pleased. We turned it over to Air Resources Board. And uh, they eventually adopted it with relatively few changes. And uh, so... You know, I feel like it's, you know, so I think of myself as an independent academic objective, but I have to confess in this case I've had a lot of involvement with it, so perhaps I feel a little ownership of it as well, and maybe that affects my view. But I really, you know, as I'll tell, say, I really believe this is one of the most important uh, energy or climate policies that are under consideration or being adopted. And for California, I'd say it's even more important than cap and trade, just to give you a sense of 
the role it, it could play. And so now I'm involved working, uh, taking the, so it's been adopted in California, I'll give you the history in a moment, but now we're taking it national, and so there's a national study team that I'm co-directing, uh, and we're looking at how to take what we've done in California but make it national. And there are a lot of changes that would have to be made to make it work nationally, and I'll mention a few of those later. So, oh, got it. I can't stand to look at this slide. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> there you go. Okay, so some of the big questions here that we're going to be addressing, you know, Dave and I are both going to be addressing is, you know, is this really the best way to reduce greenhouse gases and oil use uh, associated with transportation fuels? And there's questions of, is it the most economically efficient, how effective, equity, politics, you know, how easy is it to do it? Uh, is the science, scientific foundation adequate to do it? Uh, life cycle analysis, is this the right method to be using, which is the method that we're, the foundational method we're using to develop the low carbon fuel standard. And there's the polit political issues. And, you know, when you, I mean, quite frankly, the goal of this is to transform the oil industry. Now, if, you're, if you take on a challenge like that, you can imagine there might be a little pushback. <laughs> and uh, there has been. <laughs> and Dave will elaborate on that, uh, I know. But it's not just the oil industry, you know, there's also the corn ethanol industry has felt threatened uh, that, you know, this will undermine their product as well. So there's been a lot of, there has been a lot of political challenges to it. And there's been administrative challenges, and that is that, you know, the Air Resources Board, as it, you know, it used to just do air pollution, it tended to you know, be purely a regulatory body. You know, I use the phrase command and control, that's kind of pejorative, you know, it sounds Stalinist. Um, and, but we've gone way beyond that. Um, but it's still more working with performance standards and regulatory approaches. And now as we move into energy and climate, we're having to look at it more broadly. We, the Air Resources Board, and by the way, I, I get confused sometimes. I have two hats, my academic hat and then my Air Resources Board hat. So I'll, kinda, I'll try to uh, keep those separate uh, as much as possible. But so the Air Resources Board, though, it's evolving as an agency. It's taking on big challenges. It's administering the cap and trade program. It's administering, you know, the low carbon fuel standard and a lot of other programs. And so, you know, moving beyond, you know, the more straight, I'll call it the more straightforward rulemaking to broader programs that have, uh, that are harnessing market forces, using more market-based approaches, is really an evolution. And, and so it's part of the challenge. So to put it in context here, um, the low carbon fuel standard is part of California's overall effort to reduce greenhouse gases, uh, you know, across the whole economy. And it started, the history of this for California is back in 2002, California passed a law, uh, so it was known as AB 1493, it became known as the Pavley Act, Pavley Standards, which set vehicle standard, green, greenhouse gas standards for vehicles. So that got started, had a you know, long, complicated history. There were lawsuits, and it was a very tortured life it led until President Obama uh, became president, where he told California that it had permission to go ahead with the standard. Not only that, he was going to uh, order the whole country uh, through EPA and, uh, and regulatory agents to administer for the entire country. So this is a case where California leadership has been embraced nationally. And many of these things that we're talking about, uh, that happens. And low carbon, one of the reasons there's concern about low carbon fuel standard from a lot of companies is that there is the recognition that, it, you know, if it works in California, if it's adopted in California, it's likely to go not only national, but international. So anyway, there's a whole series of laws. The big law was 2006. Um, um, the Global Warming Solutions Act of, of 2006 under uh, Governor Schwarzenegger, which provided the umbrella for all of these regulations, all of the regulations after that, including the low carbon fuel standard. And so the low carbon fuel standard now has been adopted and it is just starting to be implemented uh, this year. The overall goal of California, the goal, the AB 32 goal for California is to reduce emissions back to 1990 levels by 2020 
and that represents about a 28, 25, 28 percent reduction from uh, business as usual from what it would have been otherwise. And then you see the dotted line there that shows that's the target uh, for an if we're going to have an 80 percent reduction by 2050, which is an executive order of the uh, governor. So it just shows how much reduction in emissions we're talking about. So this is really, I mean, this is transformational. This is revolutionary. Um, this is a big change. And just to give a little more context here, um, uh, this is a somewhat complicated, but it just shows that the bar on the left is, again, that business as usual uh, forecast of emissions for California. And then the bar on the right is how many emissions would there be under AB 32 in 2020. And I, I show this only to put up there, you know, circled there is a low carbon fuel standard. And, and so it's one of the most important in terms of emission reductions, but it's not the most important. The vehicle reductions are the most important, and then there's others there. So it is one of the most important in terms of emission reductions, uh, but certainly not the only. Now, to put it in context, you know, one of the debates, discussion items we're going to have here, and it's a very legitimate one, is that uh, are we focusing too much on fuels? Is this too difficult, too hard, too expensive? Should we focus in other areas where it's easier and more, quote, cost effective? And indeed, it, in the transportation sector, it would be, well, overall, it's easiest to do it in electric utilities. They have lots of choices already. It's already a big mix. You know, we do nuclear, we do geothermal, we do solar, wind, natural gas. There's lots of choices. And some of them, you know, with a whole range of attributes and costs. In transportation, we only have one option right now, uh, petroleum, and a little bit on ethanol. But, you know, so far it's only corn ethanol, which is not, uh, does not provide large reductions uh, uh, for emission reduction. So in the transportation sector, it's clear the easiest thing to do is vehicles. And if we get into it in Q&A, we can talk about it more. Fuels is clearly more difficult. And then reducing actually our vehicle use as a third leg of the stool for transportation. You know, you think of transportation strategies as being vehicles, fuels, and mobility. So here we're focusing just on the fuels. And the question is, you know, are we focusing too much on the fuels? Do we focus too more on other areas? All right, so being into fuels, um, I refer to the history of alternative fuels as uh, going through a fuel du jour, as being part of a fuel du jour phenomenon. And that is, we focus on a fuel, we get all excited about it as an alternative, and politicians get excited, the media gets excited, we raise our expectations, and guess what? We're disappointed. And so we get rid of that one. And we move on to another one, and then we get excited about that. So it started, we did sin fuels, which is now what we call unconventional oil, oil sands, uh, coal-based oil shale. Came and went. Then it was methanol in the 80s, came and went. And then in the 90s, it was battery electric cars, came and went. Then it was high, in the early years of the last decade, it was hydrogen, came and went, at least in the public eye. Then it was corn ethanol that came, and it's still here, but it's now widely acknowledged to not be an attractive option uh, to be pursuing or to be expanding at least. And now, probably the fuel du jour now, we're back to electricity, and the question is what's next? And what I would argue is if we didn't have policy intervention, we would just go right back to the top of that list and start over again. Because that's what oil companies are good at. They're essentially big engineering companies bring together a lot of capital, big projects, and that's what oil sands and coal-based fuels and oil shale are. And so that's what they're good at. That's their core competence. That's what they'll do, you know, left on their own. And so the question is, you know, is this acceptable from a societal perspective and what to do about it? So the different approaches we can use, 
you know, I put them into four categories in terms of dealing with fuels. We can have, vo we can have man volumetric mandates, meaning you just require companies to sell a certain amount of fuel. And we have that on the national level. It's the, called the renewable fuel standard. Companies have to sell a certain amount of biofuels. You can do fuel subsidies. We do that also with corn ethanol. You know, right now in the United States today, a little factoid that should stick in your mind is we're spending uh, something close to $10 billion a year subsidizing corn ethanol. $10 billion. And it's not even such a great idea. All right? So, you know, but, it, but, it can, but it's effective. And then there's market instruments. And that would be uh, using uh, taxes, carbon taxes, or cap and trade would be the most, carbon cap and trade would be the most likely market instrument we would want to use uh, for fuels. And then the low carbon fuel standard, which uses, harnesses market forces like a carbon tax or cap and trade because it has credit trading, but also has a performance standard. And so it's, in a sense, it's very much more of, a for, it's more of a forcing mechanism than a pure market instrument. So very quickly, um, I know Dave likes carbon taxes, so I'm sure we're going to hear about it in a moment. <laughs> but um, so very quickly, I'll, I'll take the, make the first salvo on why, uh, what the problem is. Carbon taxes and cap and trade are a great idea. I'm 100% behind both of them. My first preference would be carbon taxes. Politically, that's not doable. You know, we, you know, polit there, I don't know any major politician that's willing to support a carbon tax. So we do cap and trade as a, you know, something a, a, that's very close to a, a carbon tax. It's, you know, its effects are very similar, just about as effective and can be even more effective depending on how it's designed. The problem is, in the transportation fuel sector, there's, there's not much response to prices in terms of bringing about alternatives. Not on the consumer side, not on the supply side. So we would need a carbon, a huge carbon tax to induce industry to invest in alternative fuels and to encourage customers to buy the alternatives. And this is just a, a little graph here. This is from the Waxman-Markey bill that, was, that the House of Representatives passed. And when they did an analysis of that, they found that that, that cap and trade program would result in a, a probably only about 5% reduction in greenhouse gases from, from fuels. Almost all of it would be in the electricity sector. So you might argue that's OK. Um, I would argue that's not okay because we need to get on a trajectory towards alternatives. And so we need something beyond a simple market instrument to make that happen. All right, so actually this slide tells all about that and I want to move on a little bit. So what's a low carbon fuel standard? A low carbon fuel standard is a performance standard. What it does is it tells the regulated party, the oil companies, for the most part, that they must reduce the carbon intensity of the fuel that they, su they supply, in this case, by 10% by 2020. And they can do that by uh, blending in low carbon biofuels into the gasoline. They can do it by selling natural gas. They can sell hydrogen. Um, they could even sell electricity for vehicles. And if they don't want to do it themselves, they can buy credits from some other company that's willing to do it. So it creates a market for uh, low carbon fuel. So it harnesses market forces and has a performance standard. So in, uh, so in this way, um, it's provide, fundamentally what it's doing is it's stimulating innovation. It's stimulating innovation in alternative fuels. It's requiring investments in it and not telling industry how to do it, not telling customers how to do it, but telling, saying you have to do something and then leaving it to the marketplace to figure out what to do. 
Now, the, the, the method that's used is life cycle analysis. And in the academic world, you know, most of us think this is a great idea. And I do as well. But there are some people that raise questions about um, whether we have enough knowledge to actually specify the emissions for each step of the, uh, of, of the energy chain. And then there's even people that get into the question of, uh, well, if you want to get into this, ask me about attributional versus consequential methods. But <laughs> Um, we'll leave that for later because I want to move on. So, so life cycle is taking, looking at the emissions from the source to the wheel. It's the whole energy cycle. And so in a scientific sense or academic sense, you'd say this is the right way to do it because you're capturing all of the effects from the beginning to the end. Now, the, the, there are questions that arise about uh, defining some of the steps along the way. And if we get into a debate about it, I would argue that we know a lot. We know more than enough to specify those numbers along the way. You know, we can have a debate about that in a moment. But probably the, there's only one, in my mind, there's only one really legitimate question about the use of life cycle analysis for fuels. And that is this phenomenon of land use change. So how many of you, when I say indirect land use change, how many of you know what I'm talking about? All right, I like this crowd. Um, <laughs> so, you know, for the rest of you, basically it's just the idea that if we take land that's growing crops and we use some of that land to grow, ener uh, grow energy crops, to use, instead of making food or, or uh, being used for other purposes, now we're using it for energy. So now we have to make up for that food production somewhere else, somewhere else in the state, the country, the world. And so there's this indirect impact. And the, and the problem is that when you move into these additional lands, um, you're going to move into more marginal lands um, by definition, because otherwise those lands would already be used for uh, agricultural production. So you move into these other lands, and what happens is that a huge amounts of carbon are released when you convert that land into energy use. So there's biomass underground that you get rid of, you know, the roots and stuff. There's stuff above ground, the trees and so on that you get rid of. And the most serious would be if you had a rainforest, which has huge amounts of biomass, you're releasing all of that. And another real disaster is uh, what's happened in, in Southeast Asia and Malaysia in some places where you have peat covering the land. So they rip off the peat, they rip down the forests, and you release so much carbon that way that you end up with producing maybe, in that case they do it to make palm oil, you end up releasing three or four times as much carbon, in some cases more, as the gasoline you're replacing. It's clearly not a good idea. And so Life cycle analysis and indirect land use impact can, can deal with that. The problem is the science is not real well developed yet for those land use changes. And so one of the questions is, um, is it legitimate to go, up, go ahead with a rule that uses land use change as part of the life cycle analysis when we know there's still some scientific uncertainty about exactly what it is? All right, so um, I'm going to... So the low carbon fuel standard is, so it started in California, but almost at the same time it started in the European Union. So the European Union is adopting something very similar to the low carbon fuel standard. Um, Washington and Oregon are also moving toward a low carbon fuel standard. The northeastern states are pretty advanced in, in investigating uh, doing it. There's a lot of enthusiasm there. And there has been, in the past, there was some interest in Washington until there was a change of Congress. That's a nice way of putting it, right? <laughs> All right, so I, I've kind of mentioned some of these. So these are the four challenges, I would say, the key challenges, that land use change that I already talked about. And then there's a leakage issue, and that is that if only California does it, then the oil sands produced in Canada, well, if it has high carbon, they won't send it to California. They'll send it somewhere else. And so all you've done is shuffle it around. 
is, is you know, a criticism of it. And energy security is associated with that. And then there's sustainability issues associated with these biofuels. So I'm got, I have to go through this quick. So I'm going to, I'll have these slides and we, if we have questions, I'll go back through them. It just detailed each of those four. So I want to say that, you know, going beyond California, like with the national standard, we can do that. It'll be a little different. We don't have to necessarily use the same 10% number. We can use a different percent number. We can inu include other fuels. In, Trent, in California, we only do highway fuels. But, you know, in theory, we should include aviation fuels, we should include maritime. The northeastern states want to use, include home heating oil. So there's different ways of designing it. There's an issue about electric vehicles. You know, how do you deal with electricity? Because it's different, has a different carbon footprint everywhere. So we have to take in that into account. And then you got to reconcile it with cap and trade and others. So in summary, I believe, and, and this is based upon you know, decades of research, decades of involvement in the policy process, that this is the most effective near-term and medium-term policy um, that we can pursue to, uh, uh, to address this challenge of bringing into being low-carbon alternative fuels. I can't, you know, I've thought about it a lot. I can't think of any better ones. Uh, it's, it includes all fuels. It's fuel neutral. It's performance based. It relies on market forces. Provides a durable framework uh, to use over time. All we have to do is adjust the targets over time. We've got the whole framework in place. And so it seems to me that I can't think of a better way of doing it. Um, and, you know, certainly there's always going to be, if you're going to take on a challenge where you're transforming an industry um, or two, there is going to be political challenges. And so, of course, there is. Uh, and, and so, you know, I do see urgency in moving ahead with this. Uh, and, and that's premised on the idea, if you believe climate change is a problem, and if you believe dependence on oil uh, imports is a problem, I think there's urgency in going ahead. I mean, if you don't agree with those premises, then you won't agree with that conclusion. I also would argue that no, I mean, I've studied this for decades. I don't know what the best energy path forward is. I know that there's several choices that some look better than others, but I don't know exactly the best way to do it. You know, I'm not going to sit there and make a decision that you know, government should be pursuing this or Exxon should be pursuing that. So this is a policy that, is, that leaves it open to industry and consumers in the market. You know, it doesn't pick winners and allows these different options to play out, you know, but meeting this metric of reducing the carbon footprint. And so, you know, in, I acknowledge and I know there's a lot, there's more research that needs to be done. There's more details that have to be worked out. But if we delay, you know, the question is if we delay, are we going to do any better job in two years? I would argue that putting the framework in place now, getting started, uh, is the right thing to do. We need to tweak it and improve it as we go along. But I think this is you know, fundamentally the right approach. Thank you. Okay. You know something, I just after thinking about it, maybe we'll do the same thing. Maybe a little easier. Sure. That's fine. Let's not upset the apple cord on this. So um, first of all, I want to thank Sally for organizing this and, and, and everybody here for, for, uh, uh, for coming here, Dan and I. Um, what I'm going to talk about are challenges in meeting local and fuel standards. So in addition to laying out the policy, the question is how do you achieve it? Okay. Um, assessing policy options to reduce emissions requiring, requires a good understanding of their effectiveness and also 
what how scalable they are, what they're going to cost, and what the practical implications of having that kind of policy are. So in order to, to address this, what I'm going to do today is to discuss, can people not hear? Sure. Okay. In order to address this, sure, that's fine. Somebody's got to flip my slides in if that's the case. Usually people say I need to quiet down, but <laughs> Andy can attest to that. Um, <clears throat> okay, now is this, a, is this a little better? Okay, good. So if that's the question in hand, what, I, what I'd like to do is to, to start is to review policy principles for sound policy development, to take a look at the challenges in LCFS and judge them in terms of how to implement them and see if they actually do meet sound, uh, po uh, po uh, you know, the, the issues associated with sound policy development, um, and try to take a look at what those challenges are and what other potential solutions are. When we did this and we looked at LCFS policy, our conclusion was that LCFS is complex. It's not cost effective. It's not a transparent way to reduce GHGs. That certainly goes in contrast to what Dan had talked about before. I'd like to tell you why. And I'm going to take you through a couple of practical examples in order to do that. Um, we're also going to kind of cover some parts of the market to understand what the cost effectiveness is of an LCFS policy and what other ways are to reduce greenhouse gases in the transport sector. Okay, so we'll, we'll go through all that. Okay, so the first, first part of this is, is uh, kind of a list of uh, ExxonMobil policy principles. And you can view this as Applehood and mother, you know, as, as motherhood and apple pie in a way. But we believe communicating a clear message about climate risk is going to encourage the implementation of public policies that are help the world meet its energy needs in the future, as well as reduce emissions. But again, start with a base set of principles that you want to use to design the policy. Okay? So they're listed up here. Ensure a uniform and predictable cost of GHG emissions in the economy. Okay. Uh, you want to let the market decide what solution to pick. Okay. And it's going to do that based on what the prices are for, for, the, for those different options. You, want, you need to have global participation. You don't want to have it in a local area. Uh, you need to make sure that you're doing this effectively so the developing world can react as well as the, develop, the developed world. And also, you don't want to have consequences of different national policies so that you have limited competitiveness. And that actually goes, cuts back in this particular instance to states as well and, and regional LCFS issues. You want to make sure that the, that the policy itself is not complex. You don't want to have high administrative costs. You want to be able to have this happen without, without undue burden administratively. You want to have it transparent. So the question of, you know, if, if I'm looking to regulate greenhouse gases over here, I don't want to say, well, I'm going to have to go over here in order to get that uh, regulation to be uh, to be met and also I need to have the flexibility in the policy to adjust to future developments in climate science and the economic impacts of climate policies okay so again th this is a set of policy principles and what I'd like to do now is take you through the LCFS in terms of how how it can be achieved and let's judge or, for ourselves you know whether, whether you think it's it's achievable or not so this is similar to a slide that Dan had put up um, the California Air Resource Board, or CARB, CARB's assessment of well-to-tank and well-to-wheels emissions. Okay, so if I look at this, I, div I could divide this up into two sections. One of them is I'm going to get the fuel to the tank, you know, better known as the well-to-tank portion of a life cycle analysis, and I need to, I need to burn the fuel, and that's the tank-to-wheels part, that, that, uh, the consumption part. Again, I could divide these into two sections, roughly, tw uh, you know, 22% up front and 78% in the back. Okay. The LCFS mandates reducing carbon intensity 10% overall. Okay. Where does it come from? It's going to come from the back end of this. Right? It's going to come from blending low carbon intensity biofuels or the use of some alternative vehicles. Dan described this before. You know, it's a question of um, you know, maybe I need to use electric vehicles or CNG or hydrogen or some other way to do that. Right? So the first, the first issues. Is, is, is this, if I, if I have, if I, if I need to meet a low carbon fuel standard at low carbon intensity reduction credits, uh, targets, I could get there by using low carbon intensity biofuels, okay? But I can't get there once I start to have large targets that I need to achieve in terms of carbon intensity reduction, okay? And, I, and, and the reason why is that, is that the biofuels aren't going to make it on their own, 
So then I need to get to a point where I'm subsidizing other types of transportation. So as a petroleum, as a fuel supplier, what I now need to do is to think about how I'm going to support uh, introducing large numbers of electric vehicles in order to do that. Again, that's, a, that's, that's one of the issues that we're going to go through um, in, in terms of how, how, to, how to do this. And I'm going to take you through the, the various steps involved in terms of the math. Okay, so, so the first part of it is looking at biofuels. Right? So biofuels alone cannot re deliver 10% GHG reduction by 2020. Okay, so here, here are some numbers from CARB that go through available biofuels, and these are, again, a fairly wide variety of biofuels that, uh, again, CARB is proposing. If you look through the CARB website, you'll find, I don't know, I think there are 30 or 40 different life cycle analysis examples now for producing different biofuels using different types of techniques. So on the left-hand side, what I see is a baseline for gasoline, which has a carbon intensity of roughly 95 grams per megajoule. It includes two pieces, again, the manufacturing and the combustion piece. And then a couple of different sources of ethanol, high carbon intensity corn, which is a bit larger, has a larger CI than, than, than the baseline, and low carbon intensity corn, sugarcane ethanol, cellulosic ethanol. And out of those, you know, again, uh, both of those have, have uh, you know, values that range from, from a little bit greater than gasoline to, you know, in the mid-20s for cellulosic ethanol, okay? So if I look at how to do the blend, which is on the right-hand side, you know, how do I achieve my 10% carbon intensity uh, reduction target? If I blend 10% of that particular biofuel, I get the carbon intensity indicated by the red bar. If I blend 15% of that biofuel, I get the bar indicated by on the blue. Why are those numbers significant? Because if I look at how I can blend in the marketplace, I can blend up to 10% using what exists in the vehicles, in the fuel dish, in, in, the, in the retailing stations, in the, in the distribution system, et cetera. Once I get beyond that, I need to build a whole new infrastructure. I have issues with vehicles. Uh, so so what, what that is, is that's something called a blend wall. So we get to 10% ethanol blends, and then we have issues beyond that point, okay? Uh, so, so, you know, because of that, I have some restrictions in terms of, of how much biofuel I could blend in order to, to end up getting a net reduction in carbon intensity. Now, when I look at the biofuels here and I look at the numbers in terms of being able to meet my low carbon fuel standard, the only biofuel that gets me up to significant numbers, and I talked about this earlier, is cellulosic ethanol, which is not commercialized as of yet. Okay, there hasn't been any cellulosic ethanol sold in the U.S. in, in what they call the U.S. REN system, which is EPA's way of monitoring bio, of, of ways of monitoring bio, biofuels. Now, <clears throat> cellulosic ethanol has been through a lot of development for a number of years. We're all waiting to, to kind of, we're all kind of anxiously following how, that, how the commercialization process is going. But that's not something that's available. Okay, so right now we can't meet a low carbon fuel standard using biofuels, particularly at these kinds of levels. Note the, the, the biodiesels themselves have fairly low carbon intensity reduction, so they're not going to help us get there either. Okay, so there are some arguments put forward also about an alternative strategy for biofuels, which is to use high ethanol blends. So in Brazil, Brazil sells a lot of what they call E85, which are ben blends primarily consisting of ethanol, with some and, and again, grown from sugarcane locally in Brazil, uh, with some amount of fuel enough to help with the combustion characteristics of the fuel to make sure that, that we, can, we can run. And, and, and in Brazil, there's a, a lot of E85 sold at the same kind of fuel station where I have a conventional fuel and, and a high ethanol fuel. But let's look at that here and how do we, how do we apply it, right? So, um, the, you know, the, the issue with E85 is that I'm not, I don't have enough supply of low carbon intensity biofuels to get to a 10% GHG reduction. So even with E85, okay? So here are some numbers that, you know, to, to consider for this. Um, we talked before that California corn can have CI values that are actually higher than the gasoline, um, you know, than the baseline gasoline. And, and there could be some, depending on its production techniques, they'd be somewhat lower, but they're close. Okay, so that's not a feasible solution for this. If I have sugarcane ethanol, I need 72 billion gallons a year of production in order, if I'm going to use the 85, to be able to get a 10% reduction in carbon intensity. That's 10 times Brazil's production in 2008 and 2009. Okay? So it doesn't seem feasible because of the volumes that are, that are required for that. 
If I want to use cellulosic ethanol, I need 21 billion gallons a year, which is twice what they call the RFS2 mandate. I'm going to get to what the RFS2 is, but it's a standard that's, that encourages the use of biofuels. In fact, it regulates biofuels, including corn ethanol and advanced cellulosic fuels, and I'll explain what that is a little bit later. But the bottom line is I'm still far away from any volumes like this. I'm not producing any of that today. Okay, so we're, we're talking about, about a reg that's taking effect now, but we don't have the fuels that can help us to get there. There are also uh, practical issues in terms of distribution systems, numbers of vehicles, et cetera. So if I want to absorb 21 billion gallons a year of ethanol with AD5 use, uh, you'd need, I need an awful lot of E85, so better than a thousand ton, full greater than, than what might exist today. I need a lot of flex fuel vehicles. Flex fuel vehicles are growing, the fleet of flex fuel vehicles in the U.S., but I'm still a long ways away. I got six million today. And I need 60,000 E85 service stations versus roughly 2,000 that exist in the Midwest today. So I'm a long ways away in terms of meeting it if I'm going to use A85 as my solution. Okay, I described in, in, you know, a little bit before what RFS2 is, but let me tell you a little bit more about that in detail. And, and again, Dan alluded to it before. It's a federal biofuels mandate called RFS2, and it's a direct incentive to develop advanced biofuels. Okay. Um, it's part of the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007, and it's expansion of an original RFS called RFS1, which is shown down here, which was really a corn ethanol mandate. Okay. And in this mandate, there are four separate mandates for biofuels. One is for corn ethanol, which is, and the volumes are shown in the yellow patch at the bottom. There's also a mandate for biomass-based diesel, which is the red part, advanced non-cellulosic fuels, and the top blue part, which is advanced cellulosic fuels. Okay, so there's already a mandate that exists for producing cellulosic ethanol or advanced biofuels. And note also over here, there are associated GHG savings that are required if you're going to use that particular fuel that they meet those GHG reductions. Okay, so what I'd argue is that if I'm looking to incentivize low carbon intensity biofuels, I already got a regulation that does that. So, so I'm, you know, I think, you know, um, so the question that I have to pose is, what does LCFS offer in addition to what already exists as a law, as a regulation that we need to meet um, in terms of encouraging advanced biofuels, low carbon intensity biofuels, okay? Um, you know, so that's, that's, a, that's, a, that, that's certainly a, a potent part of, of considering, um, you know, how, how to look at an LCFS. Again, I got the reg already. Um, the next question is, it, is, is about what's the currency that I'm going to use to do to meet this regulation? And Dan introduced life cycle analysis as a tool to do that. So there's a lot of information on the slide, but let me start to tell you, you know, um, how, you know how, how we look at this. So there, there are low carbon fuel standards, as Dan mentioned, in Europe and also in British Columbia. Okay, in Europe, the currency is measured by a program. Um, called BioGrace. In Canon, it's, it's measured by a program called Genius Genius. These are different life cycle analysis methodologies. There are two different crops that are shown here in these four bars. Okay, each crop is measured by the, by the method done in Europe and also the method done, used in, in Canada. So the four outside bars are rapeseed and canola, which are basically the same crop. Canola is really the, the Canadian version of canola that's been, of rapeseed that's been refined a little bit. And, and the first thing to note is that if it, it, the European rapeseed has a calculated carbon intensity of 46 grams per megajoule, and Canadian canola has a carbon intensity of 11. So I got the same product, but I got, I got one jurisdiction that's telling me it's worth 46 grams per megajoule and another jurisdiction that's telling me it's worth 11. That's a pretty big delta. Okay? There are some differences that could be rationalized. For example, you know, how do I do cultivation, et cetera. But you know, what, what, I, what we'd have to say is that there are some, certainly some imprecisions in terms of how the modeling is done, you know, in a cross-jurisdictional sense. Okay? Now, if I look at soybean, I also have two fairly different values. I got 50 if I'm doing this in Europe, and I got a number of 22 if I'm going to do this in British Columbia. Okay? So, again, same, same kind of question. You know, I got very, very different uh, aspects of it. Some of this we can understand. There are different transportation um, uh, GHG is associated with growing a soybean crop someplace and, and, and perhaps doing some additional transportation, but the numbers are sufficiently different that it makes you question 
the, met the underlying methodology. If I, uh, the, the other part of this is to look at the large negative green parts of that chart. Okay, those green parts are for co-product impact. And Dan described that earlier. And the question is, if I'm going to grow a crop like soybean, I'm going to use the animal, you know, I'm going to use the, you know, the non-oil part of that as animal feed, as animal protein. Okay, it's a large number that's associated with that, uh, with that particular crop, and it's a large credit. But when I'm starting to produce these fuels on a scale that's going to, you know, when I'm going to produce these, these particular molecules on a scale that's going to be used as a fuel, um, I'm going to need an awful lot more of it, and I'm going to swamp the animal protein market. So those credits are going to, are going to start to diminish or vanish. Okay? So, so when I look at this, I say, if, if those credits go away, am I really getting a GHG benefit by using those particular biofuels? Okay? So you know, I'm not trying to say that I could solve each one of these, and I realize that these are particular jurisdictions that are enacting their own flavor of, of an LCFS. Um, but I would argue that life cycle analysis may not be precise enough at this point to be able to say, state on an absolute basis what the carbon intensity of a particular fuel is. You know, and the issue is that if, if I'm looking to sell a fuel and I need it to meet a particular property, I need to have that precision. If I'm going to sell a low sulfur diesel, I need to know that it's got 10 ppm sulfur. And I need to have a, a measurement technique that tells me that. And part of the question about the maturity of life cycle analysis, is it ready for, to, is it really up to this challenge? Okay, an another question that comes up, and Dan mentioned this before, is about the use of uh, Canadian oil sands. And I want to talk about, about the crude use in terms of an energy security picture. So if I, if I look at the pie chart on the right-hand side, pie chart shows our crude import picture. 23% okay? of our crude today comes from Canada. And this is information from the Energy Information Agency. This is an independent agency that monitors lots of this and reports on it on a quarterly basis on, and publishes on the web. A quarter of our, of our crude comes from Canada. LCFS policy may reduce the, the use of, of crude such as Canadian oil sands in the LCFS jurisdiction. But just because I'm restricting it in California doesn't mean I'm not going to use oil sands elsewhere. Okay, so, um, you know, so, it's like, so if I'm going to use crudes elsewhere, I'm, I'm going to get back to, to a point a little bit later called crude shuffling where the crudes might be shipped someplace else. But I also want to bring up something Dan mentioned too, uh, which is called leakage in the LCFS literature, right? So if I'm manufacturing um, the crude in a particular jurisdiction like Alberta that already has a cap and trade policy called SGER, okay, to help to regulate, you know, that, you know, that the, 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 uh, uh, the DHGs that are produced at the source, you know, one of the questions we have is why is that not an effective enough policy in order to regulate it outside of the, the, the place that it's being produced? Okay, so that's something we're, prob we're probably going to come back to afterwards in our, in our, uh, uh, in the post discussions, but let me come back to this point of of, uh, of crude shuffling. If I have LCFS, then again I talked about what the crude discrimination is likely to be. But it, but again, this may drive crude shuffling. And, and the way crude shuffling works is that if I have a a, a a Canadian oil sand that could be could be pipelined down to the Midwest, right, as it is today, right, very low energy intensity compared to other routes. Um, if I can't use that crude, perhaps I need to load it onto a ship and maybe ship it to, to the Far East, okay, and divert the crude that the Far East would have gotten and ship it to U.S. in exchange so that I have the same net crude imports. So what I've done now is I've taken the Canadian crude and shipped it elsewhere and imported crude that was coming from the, you know, in order to replace that crude that I got replaced. So the net result is not changing the crude use patterns but increasing the net GHGs for transportation in that crude, because now it's not being shipped fairly short distances. Again, it's called crude shuffling. Bar is an engineering firm that did a modeling study and showed that I can get some significant increases in crude transport GHGs if I'm going to do this, this kind of practice. Okay, so I talked about LCFS from a couple of standpoints, about, um, you know, about the practicality of implementing it and some issues associated with biofuels and the like. Now, let's, let's talk about other solutions, because really the question is, if we're looking at GHG policy, what else can we do, right? 
So the first part of this is I want to talk about different types of vehicles and other types of solutions that we might, we might go to. So this is an analysis that's often quoted in this field, and it's, and it's a, it's a future-looking study done by Professor Haywood at MIT. And it's a, it's a study called On the Road Again 2035. So in this study, what they looked at was for the top, and I show it in the top three bars, the well-to-wheels GHG emissions for different types of vehicles, electric vehicles, plug-in hybrid vehicles, and hybrid vehicles, okay, as they would be in 2035. And the numbers on the top show natural gas, grid, and coal, in other words, what type of electricity is used to power those those vehicle options, okay? And again, these are based on a U.S. grid average basis, and in places like California, I'm gonna have about 25% lower carbon intensity. But the conclusion, you know, what, you know, there's some important conclusions to draw from this slide. The first one is the highest line here is what the U.S. gasoline car is in 2008. Um, CAFE standards are gonna take that down significantly. Right? So by 2016, I've made some significant improvements, but they're still much higher than what, what's, what the case is in Europe. Okay? But the most fuel-efficient options are hybrids. Right? Uh, EVs and PHEVs, depending on the electricity source, are going to be close to that. I'm not going to argue about that differences. But let's take a look back, uh, look back at, the, at the premise of an LCFS. I want to get 10% GHG reduction. 10% is a pretty small number on this chart. So I got ways that I could get for more than 10% GHG reduction, okay? And, and again, it's, I think it's fairly well illustra illustrated here. Okay, something else about economics. We talked about some of the critical policy uh, elements being that it's gonna be something that's economically feasible. So this chart shows what the CO, CO2 abatement economics are or what the cost of CO2 avoidance is for a couple of different technology options. Okay, so the options in green have to do with the transport sector, the options of red have to do with the power gen sector. Okay, what do you want to do? You want to pick the most cost-effective ones for society, and then you want to try to figure out how much, I want to try to dial in how much G redu GHG reduction I need. And as I do that, now I get a sliding scale and I figure out what, what the cost of carbon needs to be. That's, a, that's an economic market-based solution to solving the problem of GHG reduction. So the most economic options, particularly in the transport sector, or make conventional engine improvements. I clearly, I, I think I demonstrated that fairly well in the last slide. I can go to start-stop hybrids. The most expensive options are to look at biofuels. Okay, so first-gen ethanol, second-gen ethanol. CNG cars are fairly expensive. Fuel cell vehicles or plug-in hybrids are off the chart. Okay, so the question is, is it a cost-effective policy? Or what, what are other options that might be more cost-effective? This kind of gives you a roadmap. And society needs to choose what it, what it needs to do. But again, I, I, think, I think if you're looking at setting a policy that's most cost effective, you could use something like this as a guide. So in conclusion, um, we think that LCFS is a complex cost and effective policy to reduce GHGs. On a cost per unit GHG reduction, transportation fuel related cost reduction substantially exceed the cost of other GHG reduction. But more importantly, if the policy goals are to promote biofuels or to electrify the fleet, let's get some direct and transparent regulations as a way to meet these goals. So Dan talked about the flexibility of this, but you know, if, if the goal really is something besides GHG reduction, let's actually have a statement of what it is, and let's actually have a regulation that cuts directly to that, to that goal. If the policy goal is GHG reduction, the most efficient and cost-effective approach is a broad-based revenue initial carbon tax. Set the price of carbon, let the market react. Okay. State or regional LCFS programs increase the risk of restricting transportation fuel supplies. There's a, there's, part of this is rationing. If I don't have enough low carbon intensity biofuels, okay, then I'm gonna have to start to ration fuels. So if I can't, if I don't, if that supply doesn't exist, then, then I'm gonna sell less fuel in a particular jurisdiction in order to meet it. And also I might have creative competitive disadvantages versus neighboring jurisdictions. If I got an LCFS policy here, but not here, you know, and the fuel is much cheaper here, then I got some issues. So, so you need to be careful about setting up kind of local flavors of an LCFS. The limited supply of low carbon intensity biofuels to meet LCFS mandates can result in higher fuel costs without reducing GHG emissions due to fuel shuffling. Okay? And if I have LCFS that debits certain crudes like North American oil sands, we can reduce energy security while actually increasing CO2 emissions due to the crude shuffling. Okay, so that's what I had to kind of talk through the practicalities of it. And
For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.